Hi, everyone. Welcome once again to episode number nine of Restitch America. Thank you so much for joining us today. And today I have my producer with me, Jenny Johnson, and she's going to stay with me throughout the entire show. And so, Jenny, thank you for coming and thank you for joining us today. Um, today's episode is going to talk about a few things that I think are important uh, to discuss. And um, and what I'm hoping is to create a conversation around some of these things. And so I'm going to start with a quote uh, that I actually coined myself. And this quote is tied to a video that I saw that really kind of struck a chord for me. And so uh, here's the quote, and then I'll play the video. The mind has the power to show you what you've been conditioned to see, even if it has to make it up. Okay, I'm going to read it again. The mind has the power to show you what you are conditioned to see, even if it has to make it up. Okay, and when I play the video, you will understand kind of where I'm coming from with this quote. So I'm going to play this right now, and we're going to see. Right. Right with a group of women yeah. and they put scars on their faces and yeah. they told these women that they're going into a job interview uh they showed them the scars in the mirror the women saw themselves with these scars and as they led them out of the room they said we're just going to touch it up a little bit and as they touched it up they removed the scarring completely so the women went into the job interview thinking that they are scarred but actually being their normal selves and the result of the experiment is that those women then came back reporting massively increased level of discrimination. Indeed, they many of them came back with comments that the interviewer had made that they felt were referencing their facial disfigurements. And this is why I think this ideology of victimhood is so dangerous. An experiment with a group of women, yeah. and they put scars. All right, so uh, <laughs> let me just recap what you just heard if you didn't um, hear it clearly. So basically, this is uh, apparently an experiment that was done with a group of women who were going into a job interview, and mm -hmm. they wanted to touch them up a little bit with some makeup. Um, actually, before that, they they put scars on their face as a makeup, and they had them look in the mirror and see the scars on their faces. Yeah. And then just before they got into the interview room, they told them they were going to touch up the scar a little bit but they yeah. basically took it all off and when they did they went so these women went into the interview thinking that they still had scars on their faces mm -hmm. yeah and so they go into the interview and they come out and they're interviewed afterwards and apparently they reported massive levels of discrimination because mm -hmm. of their scars but the problem was they did not have any scars. Yeah. Person who interviewed them did not see any scars. Mm -hmm. They believed they had some scars. And that completely changed their perspective on how they were treated by the person who interviewed them. And so I was thinking about this and I thought, wow, what, what a powerful thing the mind is. And you know, I, and we've done some version of this experiment in our lives, right? We we've done that where we've um we've been told to to count the number of red cars and then suddenly you start seeing more red cars. Mm -hmm. And then the question you ask yourself is is it because there are more red cars or yeah. is it because I am counting red cars? Yeah. And this um the this idea proliferates into every aspect of our lives. And it's very, very interesting because for as someone who came here as an immigrant who did not have a lot of the, I would say, uh, mental baggage <laughs> that are that a lot of people carry in America because of our history and our past, mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that people point out to me and say, oh, that is happening over there. And I, I look at it and I say, I don't see it. I, yeah. I just don't see it. And and sometimes people think you're being insensitive or you're, mm -hmm. you're not truly grasping what is happening, but I just don't see it. 
Yeah. And, and that allows me to go through my day without that baggage kind of holding me back. Yeah. Because I don't go into a room expecting that someone is going to treat me a certain way. I don't go into any gathering expecting that I'm going to be looked on mm -hmm. in, in some derogatory way that I cannot yeah. control. I just don't have that baggage. And so, um, Jenny, what, what are your thoughts on, on this and this particular experiment? Well, like my first thought when I think about it is they chose a scar. And I mean, when you think of all of the things that women would hate, <laughs> especially to have on their face and the most thing that they would be most self-conscious about, it would be a scar. And I think, um, you know, there's lots of women who, you know, have scars in other places and they've had to accept them. Right. And they, but they've had that time to accept it. So these women had scars placed on their face but then told that they could cover them up, but that awareness is still there. So they're still aware that it's there, even actually, if it doesn't actually exist. Tell them, so they didn't well, they, actually <laughs> tell them. They told them, hey, let's touch up the scar, but then they took it all off. So they didn't know. Oh, so they didn't know it all? Scar, they had no oh, idea that the scar was gone. <laughs> oh, right? yeah. They had no so, idea the scar but, was gone. But they think it's there, though. Like, their perception I know. is so in their mind. And they think it's there. Because they had seen it in the mirror. Mm -hmm. They had created that perception that I have this scar. So everybody's watching me and it's yeah. going to judge me based on this scar. And so even though the scar was gone, they, they still did thought not it was know there. it. <laughs> and, and because they did not know it, their experience was completely changed. Yeah. Yeah. Because of it. Well, and I think that's, that's what really it is. Like what you were saying about perception, like they had an awareness that it was there, even if they, you know, even if it was removed, it was still in their minds there, correct? Exactly. And so they went into it thinking that probably even if it wasn't there, even if it was touched up and gone, like, because they knew it was there, they thought everybody else knew. And I think exactly. that's what, what everybody sometimes gets trapped in is they think that because they see it a certain way that everyone else must think that way. Or if they're self-conscious about some, something, someone will, or someone sees it or everyone sees it. And the reality is, unless you tell someone or unless you're very vocal about it, no one really knows what's going on. They might have like, well, she seems really uncomfortable or he seems really uncomfortable, but I don't understand why. And I think that's, you know, people have maybe an inkling that something might be up, but they're not, I mean, for the most part, people don't, try to pry or at least I don't try to pry <laughs> like I, if something was going on like I'll I'll maybe say are you feeling okay like is something going on but I don't I wouldn't think necessarily think someone was going at me but then yeah if I was hyper aware and, and like thought that there was a scar on my face I'd be a little nervous about like are they gonna think something happened to me <laughs> like is this gonna affect my interview like is this going yeah. to and so so there's lots of things that would be going through my head but yeah it would change my preparation going in and it would change my mindset a bit and now I, I, I don't know if I'd like it, it. <laughs> I want to take it into kind of a little more serious um okay a, a little more serious realm because mm -hmm. um this is just a simple interview yeah. but imagine the people who are living their entire lives with this perspective mm -hmm. right and unfortunately many of many of the people who have a perspective that the world is looking at them with Mm -hmm. discrimination or the world is looking at them with you know a certain perspective that they have to fight against everywhere they go yeah that baggage that load you know completely changes one what opportunities a person avails themselves to mm -hmm. but not only that it changes how they approach the opportunity as well and the question is what is the process of telling people if uh, supposing they don't have access to that mirror where mm -hmm. they can confirm that hey i don't actually have that scar anymore yeah how can we help people recognize that they can leave that baggage behind right mm -hmm. and that's the the challenge i think of our generation especially in america if mm -hmm. we're going to move past some of the um rhetoric around all sorts of things, race, gender, you know, sexual orientation, all those different things that today are huge um, issues in the, I would say, public square. All those things are because of perceptions that people have. Yeah. And 
the way I look at the world is I understand that I can't control everything around me. Yeah. And, and because I can't control everything around me, then my goal is to control what I have in my power. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for me, I choose what the concept that I coined called willful positivity, which is the way I go into the world. So my mirror is to look at the world in the most positive light possible. Yeah. And, and so even if someone has a perspective of me that may mm -hmm. be derogatory, I believe that I have the power to bring light into that situation in mm -hmm. such a way that I could potentially turn that de derogatory perspective to a mm -hmm. positive one, right? And so I choose to be positive because mm -hmm. there's a power in bringing that kind of positivity even into a negative situation. And yeah. that is the kind of thing that I believe will change perspectives mm -hmm. if we let it. And yeah. so once again, my quote was, the mind has the power to show you what you are conditioned to see, mm -hmm. even if it has to make it up. And so the second part of this is don't believe everything your mind thinks it sees, right? Yeah. Don't, don't believe everything. Your mind can play tricks on you. Mm -hmm. And, and so I choose in many cases to give people and situations the benefit of the doubt. So if I come yeah. out of a situation where I feel like um, something was amiss, I don't understand why you know, a person said a certain thing and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, first, I choose to look at it, like I said before, from a positive angle to say, is there yeah. something that I'm missing? Is there something that I don't understand? Mm -hmm. Right. And and then I fill that gap of understanding with, mm -hmm. I would say, love. Like yeah. fill it with love until it is proven <laughs> wrong in, yeah. with, with extra evidence. Right. Yeah. And so that's my approach. Mm -hmm. We should not allow our minds to focus on things that may not mm -hmm. actually be there. And if yeah. they are there, they may not be to the extent that sometimes our mind will exaggerate it to be. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you're sick. When you're sick, your mind plays tricks on you. How many times have mm -hmm. you been sick and then felt like you've forgotten how it feels to be well? Mm. right and you begin to feel like i'm gonna be this sick forever and yeah. nothing is gonna change and you feel miserable and your mind kind of closes out everything mm -hmm. and and suddenly you forget all your experiences knowing that oh this sickness is gonna pass mm -hmm. but you completely forget it and your mind becomes so focused on this sickness that you feel like it will never go away yeah and then you wake up one day and you're better, <laughs> right? And so yeah. the mind can play tricks on us. And so it is incumbent upon us to not, not put everything, all the eggs of our emotions into the basket of what our mind is saying mm -hmm. to us in one particular moment. There may be things that we don't see that we need to bring into perspective and that then helps us understand what is going on a little better. What do you yeah. think? So the you asked earlier about like what could be solutions to that. And a couple of things popped up in my head. The first one would be that just like how those women saw scars, it's sometimes not easy to share scars. Sometimes the most, the biggest decision is to even be vulnerable enough to be willing to share something and share something with something or someone who will listen. And and I some and that's sometimes the hard part of the person who's actually the friend or the family member. It's it's just to sit and listen and not necessarily say anything back because what that person needs is just to let that out, right? But someone who has felt this for like a long time, um, in my mind, so something we like to tell like our our children is that you actively have a choice to be miserable <laughs> or you have a choice to to change the way you're seeing it and to make it a more positive experience like you said and you know for kids that's kind of hard to understand but like they'll like anything can you know <laughs> make them miserable like a friend you know saying no that they can't play is something miserable for them so mm -hmm. 
but they can actively choose to turn that situation that makes them miserable into something that they can make light. And I, I'm someone who, you know, knows that the more good I take in, the more good I can let out. Right. Or the more I'm seeking to look for positive things or good things in my life, the more I can give to other people good. So if I'm constantly reflecting on what makes me miserable, then the, then the outside, the outward response is always going to be, I'm probably going to make the people miserable around me. (laughs) Like my husband's probably going to be like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you like this? And then at the same time, I'd be like, why am I actually like this? And there have been moments like that in, in my life, like with, you know, after having my third child, I had a little bit of postpartum depression and I knew it wasn't me and I didn't know how to cope with it. And at first I was like, well, you know, I can handle it. I'll go through it. It's fine. But then at at the same time, you know, I had that little nagging feeling of, you know, you can't go through things on your own like that. You have to actually, you know, open up. And so I opened up to my husband, who's the closest person to me and, you know, shocker, you know, he felt, he felt a lot of the same feelings I was like, he felt that, you know, things were difficult. He didn't know how we were going to, you know, power through. A lot of it was just, we were tired, (laughs) three children and we were just exhausted, but just having, you know, someone else just sit and listen and then just say, you know what, I feel exactly the same way. And I thought I was the only one. I think that opens up the doors to actually start healing those scars because scars fade over time. And if you, but you have to make the decision to let them, like, if you're going to keep picking at them and letting them fester, then they're never going to actually heal. And you're always going to have them. And you're always going to think people see them. And then eventually you're going to push people away to the point that it's like, you're not pleasant to be around anymore. And they're, I find that the people that'll hold on the longest are probably your family and your closest friends, but even the, they have a limit, like they have a limit of what they can handle and what they can't because they're human too. And so I think the first step is to just open up, be willing to actually accept that part about you and be willing to be vulnerable about it. And then to make the active choice to try to change your perspective, to try to be more positive, to look for the better things. And I think after a while, when you're starting to do that, you're not going to be focusing on the negative anymore. And when you start to be fueled with that good thing, you're going to start to crave it more. And so I, that's honestly what I think about that. I think if people are looking for the good, they will receive the good. Like just, vice versa too if they're looking for the bad they're going to receive the bad so. all right um yeah i think that sums it all up i don't know if i can add any more to that <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for sharing your thoughts there so always think doubt <laughs> doubt the things that your mind is telling mm-hmm. you and and make sure that you have the evidence to support the mm-hmm. things that you are deciding to allow yeah. into your mind Okay. All right. So let's move on from that topic and and go into another section, which um, has been very interesting to me. Uh, This section, I want to talk about, um, and I think it piggybacks from from the previous conversation. Um, And the title here I want to talk about, I say, how do we see our political opponents? How do we see our political opponents? Once again, this idea of a perception that is created around something, right? Mm -hmm. And and whether that perception is true or false. So as an immigrant coming into the country, I didn't have any sense of, you know, what Republicans are or what Democrats are or what the left or the right or the middle. I just didn't have any of that in my country. It was two main political parties. Mm -hmm. And... And most of their conversations were not very ideological. It was very yeah. tactical with respect to who can do more for the citizens of the country, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah. so there were we didn't have a lot of ideological fights, um, at least not when I was there. And yeah. just to give you a little bit of context, um, I grew up in Ghana, and in Ghana, at least from the time I was born. So the time I was 16, I knew only one president and that president had come into power through a military coup. And so that was um, interesting for, to say Mm. the least. So the very first president or presidential change that I witnessed Mm. was at 16 um, from one party to the next. And and so Mm -hmm. 
I didn't have a lot of understanding of political ideology and so on. So I came to America as a blank slate, right? As a blank slate that potentially, I guess, could have been swayed one way or the other. However, once I began to, to listen to arguments and to try to understand, you know, what works in the world and, and to read books and to do research and so on and so forth, eventually mm -hmm. I started to kind of form an ideology. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that ideology was more conservative than, um, than liberal. On the other mm -hmm. hand, um, so in spite of that, though, I have never had any animus towards people who disagree with me. So if you saw the last yeah. episode, I brought on a socialist to come and talk to us. And and he's fantastic, by the exactly, way. Exactly, right? <laughs> I, I believe in having the conversations that are necessary mm -hmm. to bring people to a place where we can tolerate each other and where we can work together to solve the pressing problems um, of mm -hmm. the country. So the way I, I put it, um, the way I put it is imagine, imagine that there's a bus full of people, mm -hmm. right, who are driving down the street and and due to some tragedy, let's say yeah. the bus, let's let's say, falls off a cliff, and mm -hmm. and now these people are isolated in a ravine somewhere. Yeah. Let's say thankfully they all survive. <laughs> and now they have to figure out a way to survive in this ravine mm -hmm. is the very first thing anybody's going to ask it you know are you a democrat <laughs> you know, yeah. let's separate ourselves you <laughs> all the democrats go over here and all the republicans go over here and we're going to have a knee-jerk reaction to oppose uh -huh. any ideas that are suggested by the democrats or you know on this side we will oppose any ideas that are suggested by the republicans and the only thing that we can agree on are the things that end up screwing both of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's basically the world we live in today in America mm -hmm. is, you know, two people or two groups of people who are stuck in a ravine we call America, <laughs> right? And we're trying yeah. to figure out how to get out and how to survive and how to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet we have broken up into these factions. And because of these breakups, mm -hmm. we have made it impossible to bring all our minds together to solve the problems that are in front of us. Mm -hmm. And so how we see our political opponents, it, I believe, is really important if we're going to solve the, the issues of our day. Mm -hmm. And when I came to America, it was not this divided, I promise. Yeah. Like, of course, um, I, I, I came in in 2003, so it was right when... Um, Bush, yeah. And, um, Bush was that was right after 9 11, too. And he, they were approaching the midterm, not the mm -hmm. midterm actually, they're approaching the re election of Bush. And so I mm -hmm. saw the whole Bush carry um, debate. Now, I was a missionary, so I, yeah. I didn't watch TV. <laughs> and so I, remember I, that as I, I was kid. not connected <laughs> to the radio or the TV, so uh -huh. I didn't necessarily. Um, know all the arguments that were being made. Mm -hmm. However, when I would go and visit people and they would have the TV on and so on, mm -hmm. I would hear bits and pieces here and there about, yeah. about them. And, and I, I began to think to myself, where do I fall on these two sides? Anyway, mm -hmm. so this is from my couple of, I was a couple of years on social media. This is what I have discovered is how many Democrats describe Republicans. And I actually wrote this down because I had to compile the list and it seemed quite oh, gosh. depressing <laughs> as I did that. All right, so I'm going to find this right here. And there we go. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... There, I am sure you have found some evidence for this somewhere online, <laughs> somewhere online. So this is how I would summarize the entire Democrat argument against Republicans. Okay. okay. All right. 
Democrats claim Republicans don't care about the health, safety, and well-being of average Americans. Now, that is a pretty big statement. That is. If you believe the people on the other side don't care, absolutely don't care. And this includes mm-hmm. themselves, right? They don't yeah. care about the health, safety, and well-being of average Americans. Mm-hmm. They don't care about women, mm-hmm. apparently. Republicans don't care about women. They don't oh. care about <laughs> Black people. Mm-hmm. They don't care about marginalized groups. They don't care about the poor or the underprivileged. Yeah. They only care about their rich donors. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Republicans don't care about anybody. They only care about their rich donors. Um, they only care about big corporations that fund their political campaigns. Mm-hmm. Now they're not talking about just Republican politicians, right? Yeah. They're talking about Republicans in general. So they're saying mm-hmm. people, the Republican mom in the middle of sub um, you know, suburban suburban, you know, New York or Utah or Tennessee, that yeah. woman, that man, that teenager, that family cares mm-hmm. about corporations more than mm-hmm. they care about the average citizen, right? Yeah. This this is another claim. They say Republicans want to take away the hard fought rights of women and minorities. They want to go back to the 50s where women mm-hmm. didn't have the same rights or minorities didn't have the same rights. I'm yeah. like, really? <laughs> Is that really what they're trying to do? Um, also, they'll say Republicans hate immigrants. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and they don't care whether those <laughs> immigrants are really legal or otherwise. They just don't like yeah. immigrants. They're xenophobic, right? Mm-hmm. And they also hate people who are not white or Christian. Yeah. Okay. That's another thing that I've heard all, all over the place that Republicans don't care about people who are white or Christian. Or, or I'm mean, sorry, people who are not white or Christian. Oh. Yeah. And so I'm like, uh, where do I find myself in that <laughs> box? Um, and also, they say <laughs> they don't care about protecting children or the elderly. They want to take away Medicare and Medicaid. Um, They just want to gut it. They want to remove it so that they can keep people in their dire medical or um, economic state. They hate the Constitution, Mm -hmm. apparently. Um, If you listen to President Biden, Republicans apparently (gasps) hate the Constitution. They hate the rule of law. They are in favor of fascism and authoritarianism. They just want some kind of Christian theology, you know, propagated through the entire country. They are racist, they're xenophobes, they are people who Mm -hmm. seek to hide their bigotry behind their religion. Mm -hmm. Um, They have a dubious love for America. And many of them are traitors, insurrectionists, and so on and so forth. Now, did I miss anything there? Now, (laughs) everything that I said has come from uh, this is a composite description from mm-hmm. politicians, from individuals that I hear on social media, from yeah. partners on TV. When you listen to certain channels, mm-hmm. you hear that. And and so, like I said, this segment, I wanted to talk about how do we see our political mm-hmm. opponents? So if you're yeah. someone who has been listening to me and has been following my my path and my journey, the name of the podcast is to Restitch America. And in order to do so, we have to begin to see the people that we need to restitch this country with. Yeah. We have to see them as people we can we can bring close to us. Because when you're stitching something, just visualize the, the the needlework, right? If you have to stitch something, you have to bring those two sides together, mm-hmm. right? And in order to bring those two sides together and create a stitch that lasts, mm-hmm. you first have to look at the frays on both sides, the edges of both mm-hmm. sides, and clean up all the frays. Yeah. Like remove all the um, the perceptions, the mm-hmm. things that cause us not to want to stitch together. Remove yeah. and clean up all the frays, and then you can bring the two sides together. And so mm-hmm. if you are seeing the other side as the antithesis to your existence, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And the other side is really a threat to your actual life mm -hmm. and livelihood. Yeah. How do you come together with that side? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share with you my personal feeling about people on the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that we know what people think about people like me and Republicans like you and conservatives all over the country, this is how I feel about people on the left, people who are Democrats, people who may not vote like me. Okay. My feeling is that we have a lot more in common than divides us. Yeah. My feeling is that if I met the average Democrat, I could have a wonderful conversation. We could talk about our family. Yeah. We would have a lot in common there. We could talk about food. We could talk about um, culture. We could mm -hmm. talk, talk about music and have a lot in common there, right? We can talk about, you know, the country yeah. and have a lot in common there, mm -hmm. right? We can, there's so many things we can talk about yeah. that we will find things in common. We can talk about our children and have things in common, right? We can talk about, you know, our educational backgrounds, our jobs, and you will find yeah. that we've had similar experiences. We could, mm -hmm. we could unite on so many more things mm -hmm. than we could find divisions. Yeah. And so when I look at the typical Democrat, there's so much that we can have in common, that we can talk about. I believe Democrats love their families. Mm -hmm. I believe they love the country, many of them. I believe, you know, they want the world to be a better place, like I do. Mm -hmm. I believe they want to stop violence, like I do. I believe they want to punish, you know, bad people and reward good people. Mm -hmm. I believe in the end, they want a better America. Yeah. And that's how I see them. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing we have to flesh out really is how do we get to this place of a better America? How do we get there? And what is the path that we take to get there? And I'm willing to listen to ideas. And for me, the only thing that is important is not necessarily, you know, the origin of the idea or what is important to me is, can we experiment on this? And if we experiment, can we then find the results of that experiment and know whether this idea works or not? If it works, let's amplify it, let's publish it, let's talk to people about it, let's implement it. Yeah. If it doesn't work, then we should be ready and willing to let go of it. And if I have any problem with people on the other side, my real problem is that there are ideas that don't work, but we've yeah. built an emotional connection to the ideas themselves, even though those ideas are not producing the results that we expect, the results yeah. that we want. And, and so my goal, if I'm speaking to a Democrat, or someone on the left just to say, these ideas that you're pushing, first, give me evidence that they work. And if you can't provide evidence that they work, then are you willing to let go of that emotional tether to that idea? Yeah. Because it sounds good. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like it is a positive thing to do. Like, you know, feeding the stray dog or feeding yeah. the stray cat. It seems good. It sounds good. But is it sustainable? Does it solve the problem? Right? And that's how I look at it. So unless someone is actively seeking to harm me, I don't presume that I'm going to disagree with them. Yeah. And my hope is to have these kinds of civil conversations so yeah. that I can help people understand where they might have a blind spot where they might have that emotional tether to an idea that does not work. And hopefully to be able to show them that there's a better way, even though the better way usually doesn't always appear to be.
I know I've been speaking for a long time. What's what are your thoughts on this? Um, well, from what you're saying earlier about your experience, it kind of made me think about like where I grew up too. Um, and I think in both of our natures, we tend to think really positively. <laughs> like we tend to be optimists and we like to think the best of people, even if like some people might think that that person's not deserving of it. I think we're very, it's very easy within our nature to be able to do that. And it makes us happy to just like talk to people or to come up to someone. Um, but like, I was thinking of just, just the environment I grew up in and a lot of my friends growing up were, were liberal or they were very, you know, on the side. And I remember during the Bush, you know, era, <laughs> a lot of the sentiment, at least in my neighborhood and my town was very much anti-war. Like they did not, they did not like, <laughs> they didn't like what was going on. And, you know, my brother at the time was serving. And so like, I didn't like it either, but at the same time, I wasn't going to like you know, bash the military or, you know, go after them because I knew that they weren't necessarily the ones at fault for that. And I wanted to make sure my brother was safe. So, and my parents felt the same. And so I think I had a lot of feelings that were probably have, you know, I would have been able to connect with people on, but I was afraid to say anything because it just seemed like the overall opinion was very much in one direction. So I didn't really share a lot of how I felt about things because, you know, it, made me nervous to even say anything. And I, you know, I wanted to you know, have my friends, but over time, I, I, I started realizing that it didn't help me in any way, but then it didn't help my friends either. Cause I don't want people to, you know, especially ones that I care about to make the assumption that they already know, like what I would think on something. Cause I think there's, I think that we make the mistake of putting ourselves in these boxes of Republican and Democrat and, I don't think people are that simple. Like even within, if they declare themselves in a party, they they may think very differently on certain things. They might think very similar, similarly with a conservative or liberal, but then on different viewpoints, think completely different. I don't I don't like saying that if you're in this camp, you only think one way. And all of those descriptions that you had thought of people in one way, and it was all very <laughs> very negative. And I'm like thinking in my head, oh man, is that really how they see? just me, but I'm not even a Republican, but like in their eyes being more conservative, they might see me as a Republican. And I think when we stop seeing people as people that are capable of various different perspectives and experiences and skin colors and just all this different, there's so much that makes up who we are that to just limit ourselves to that little box or to limit ourselves to labels or little boxes doesn't do us any justice because we might not even be in those boxes very long. <laughs> like we might change perspective or we might learn something new or more or new knowledge or new research might come about that completely alters like what our per previous perception was. It's like a constant state of experimentation almost. And so it's, it doesn't make sense to just say, oh, well, you are this because you've <laughs> you've held on to this so long or mm -hmm. you are this because this is one aspect of your identity and I think that's the one thing that's been the most frustrating to see you know the back and forth between politicians is first and foremost when I when I go and talk to someone I'm not like you said like your best example like I I do not go into talking to someone expecting them to tell me their political identity <laughs> like right out the gate like you know I'm this you know this is me and this is who I am so you know respect that you know I think that's a little silly because <laughs> like I'm getting to know someone and I'm seeing them as as human as they are and I'm human and so I want to get to know you better like tell me about you like I'm not, I'm not gonna like pry into their political life or anything exactly. like that but I, but I want to know who they are and probably, like you said before, there are probably more things that I will connect with someone on than disagree with them on. Like if there's there's another mother out there, like obviously the first thing we'll be able to relate to is motherhood. <laughs> you know, we'll be able, I mean, we probably as parents talk about our kids way too much. <laughs> and probably like all the single people out there are like, stop talking about your kids. Like stop talking about your kids. <laughs> you just talk about something else. But like, I, there are things that we can relate on and experiences that we can go through along with motherhood. And my story before, like, there's probably another mother out there that experienced having postpartum depression that she's just like, yeah, how did you get through this? And I don't necessarily think that those experiences are, are negative or anything. Like, they allow us to be able to teach and reach out to people. And maybe there's people that are 
you know, going through a similar thing or they're trying to figure out where they stand on certain things that helps them to understand different perspectives or even see that that people are just people. Like one of the one yeah. things that the one thing I liked about your interview last week or your discussion last week is that the person came out of it thinking, I trust to be able to talk to you. I, I like that I can talk to you. You're very easy to talk to. And I didn't, I, I, if I did it with someone else who's a little bit, you know, stronger in opinion, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. And I think honestly, that's what people need to do more of. They need to just create that atmosphere of, you know, being inviting and not, you know, just putting your labels everywhere and saying, if you're not this, you're already not welcome. <laughs> Because I, I mean, who who wants to go near someone that did has like a see, big F off on their forehead? Yeah. Did you, did you see there was a report um, mm. this week of a Fox News um, reporter, I believe, who was in mm. a cafe yeah. and was talking to some people and the owner came and said, we don't agree with your political views or what you're yeah. talking about and so on. And they were kicked out of this cafe. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm like, we're getting to that point where we can't even stand to hear what other people have to say. And we all yeah. in a knee jerk reaction, just mm -hmm. dismiss them. And yeah. we're, we're not dismissing ideas. And that's the challenge. We're not dismissing ideas. We're not treating, um, we're not talking about the ideas. We're not saying, hey, this is what you said that I mm -hmm. want to challenge. We're yeah. dismissing people. We're the right we're dismissing people our fellow citizens mm -hmm. we're dismissing them completely the yeah. problem with doing that is that if you dismiss people long enough and i've yeah. seen this with my own kids mm -hmm. you know my kids are growing up i have a a actually today is a, a birthday we have one birthday in the house uh, my Happy daughter birthday. turns uh, 15 today and oh. my my son is about to hit 16 next week. And so we have we have reached the point in our our parenting where we can't dismiss the kids because they have opinions, they have ideas, <laughs> and you can't just say, because I said so. It doesn't work yeah. as much anymore. And so nope. you have to now listen, even mm -hmm. if you think the ideas are not well formed or you know, well sourced or whatever, you still have to listen. And we've wow. lost a little bit of that as a society. And I'm hoping that mm -hmm. um, we can return to that sanity yeah. in the very near future. And it starts with the people who have the microphones. It starts with yeah. the people who are on TV. It starts with our leaders, our political leaders. It starts mm -hmm. with the president. It starts yeah. with all these people who have the bully pulpit who can go yeah. in and say to people, hey, guess what? This is what we're doing behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. You see us, you know, talking ideas and, and mm -hmm. arguing on <laughs> principles and policies and so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. in the end, we leave every conversation as a friend. Yeah. Right. The problem is a lot of these people we see on TV arguing and shouting at each other, mm -hmm. they are actually friends, but we don't see that part. Yeah. Right. We don't see that part. We see the vitriol. We see the argument. We see all those mm -hmm. things and they walk away. And we think that they're walking away into their own corners to continue their fight. <laughs> but then they meet somewhere and have drinks. And yeah. we are left with the emotion of the divide. Mm -hmm. We are left with that emotion. And mm -hmm. that emotion eventually becomes scar tissue. Yeah. And that scar tissue is what is the cause of a lot of the division we see and a lot mm -hmm. of the vitriol we see online. And yeah. we need to break that cycle. And I'm hoping that conversations like ours on this podcast yeah. can begin to, you know, create or recreate the atmosphere where people can talk to each other once again. All right. Like the example of your, of that you gave of your children too. Like, I think with your children, you are most likely, regardless of their arguments, they're going to lead with love. I mean, it sometimes might lead with firmness depending on how like ornery they are, right? <laughs> <laughs> but like you will lead in love. And I think one thing that you mentioned that kind of brought to mind was just, sometimes if you lead with firmness, you should always follow up with love. Because I've, I've had those moments with my children or even with like family members or friends where like something they've said or something they've done has just gotten me 
so riled up and I've either said something or, or reacted in some way that was not what I would normally do. But then, you know, it always eats at me internally, right? And so, <laughs> and so I always go back and I'm like, I'm sorry I said this. Like I follow up with love and I'm like, I'm sorry I did this. I kind of got out of my head a little bit. And I think, I think honestly, that's what's missing in a lot of cases with politicians. We, we fail to see the humbleness that comes with them actually being friends. We always see what they are, you know, what's on the television, what they're giving us the perception of. It's very catered, right? It's I very, know. This is what this it's is like a reality seeing. show that is not reality, right? Yeah. See people fighting on a reality show and we're like, yes, oh, they're really mad at each other. <laughs> and you realize that the producers are producing the whole thing. Oh, yeah. They make it them completely like that. Exactly. They, they, they bring conflict into it and they even stoke the conflict because that's what sells, right? I know. But, but as like people, we need like what you were saying. We need that resolve. We need to be able to leave as friends. We need to be able to, because it, it just, I don't know. It eats away at yourself. It like, it does. It eats away in your insight. It's not good for anybody. And that pent up frustration will just be vented somewhere else, whether it's at exactly. the person or it'll vent at someone you love. Like you, you just can't hold on to it. You have to release that burden. And so All right. that was just something that came to my mind. Awesome. All right. So let's uh, end this episode with, a, a little bit of a wrap up on some of the things that are happening in the news. So talking about the state of the economy, if you listen to the president, the economy is doing great. There's nothing <laughs> wrong. Everything is fine. You know, you may not be able to afford eggs, but outside of that, <laughs> everything yeah. is perfectly fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, just a couple of things. Google has laid off about, I believe, 12,000 people. Microsoft laid off you know, 10,000 people. And I'm seeing yeah. people show up on my social media who are posting how they found out they were yeah. laid off. And, oh, and I know. these stories are very heartrending. And it's, I don't know, I, I, I don't wish that on anybody. Yeah. Um, losing your job is a traumatic event. Even just um, searching for a job, that whole thing is so emotionally fraught. Because you, you're going to get a ton of rejections and yeah, and the ones you who respond to you, you know, the chances that you're going to get that interview and then the chances that it turns into an actual opportunity mm -hmm. is not guaranteed. And it's very emotionally draining for, for the people it who have is. to go through that. And so if you are going through that, understand that we understand your, your pain. We understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that somehow... You know, you can use that opportunity to find something else that you can do. Um, what I was thinking is all these Google engineers who have lost their jobs, like if many, you know, some of them could come together and build the next thing that is going to mm -hmm. be, you know, change our lives in the future. I think that that would be awesome. But there are people who are struggling because of this. And I know that many yeah. of these people were paid a lot of money back in the day. But mm -hmm. the fact that these companies are laying people off tells us, they're signaling because a lot of these companies have to plan five years in advance. And so yeah. they're signaling where the economy is headed. Um, and they're trying to kind of um, uh, deal with, you know, the, the hard parts right now before they, they, it gets worse. And so yeah. um, it's unfortunate, but I know a lot of people are going to get through it and hopefully uh -huh. we'll be able to get to the other side faster or sooner than later. Yeah. And one other thing I wanted to touch on was the classified documents saga. Um, so if you've been following this story, it's been morphing. So it starts with Donald Trump, right? Right before the election, he gets mm -hmm. raided because he's, he's holding classified documents um, at his estate. And everybody, all the pundits jumped on it. And they were ready yeah. to tar and feather him because... Apparently, he may have nuclear codes that he is preparing to sell to our enemies. And that's how the media framed it, right? Yeah. And and there was hysteria. And all these pundits came out and said, hey, this is never done. This was intentional. They didn't say that he, he had classified documents. They said he stole classified documents. Yeah. Right? That's exactly how it was portrayed. And mm -hmm. then we come to find out that in November... You know, Biden's team, his lawyers had also discovered that he had classified documents that yeah. he didn't have the the right to have. 
And then, of course, after that, they didn't tell anybody. They found another trove of classified documents in December. They mm -hmm. didn't tell anybody. And finally, all this has come out. Yeah. And so it comes out. And of course, they try to spin it as, hey, this is, you know, he complied. And yeah. I think what is all what is missing in that conversation, of course, is the fact that it's it's almost like the way I looked at it is um I come to your house, Jenny, I break into your house, I steal something, <laughs> and then 10 years later, I bring it back and I'm like, hey, I'm I'm complying with the investigation. No, you've been you've had this thing for 10 years. I know. <laughs> right. You've had this and, and they've even found some in his home and mm -hmm. in other places. Now, this is all I'm gonna say about it. Mm -hmm. I am a Christian, and one of the things that came to my mind when I thought about this was the the scripture that said, "Judge not that ye be not judged, for whatever yeah. judgment ye meet, yeah. that shall be meted back unto you." So yeah. they judged Donald Trump so harshly, yeah, so harshly, that it has become impossible to see what they have done. Mm -hmm. any less harsh right yeah. and so it's hard for them to now spin themselves into it was inadvertent and i know yeah. the media is helping them create that narrative suddenly the media has turned into oh there's something called classified leakage and it actually happens all the time and i thought <laughs> all right i thought you know it was deliberate and it was treasonous mm -hmm. and all this stuff but now it's just you know classified leakage and so mm -hmm. um i felt like if they had treated Donald Trump with a little bit of deference, a little bit of compassion, yeah. a little bit of, you know, let's understand the full picture before we cast these stones, mm -hmm. you know, but they were so ready to, to, to <laughs> crucify him yeah. in the public arena that they, they forgot that they had skeletons in their own closets. Yeah. And now, you know, even the former vice president has also come out to say that he found classified documents as well in his possession, and so on and so forth. So now what we've learned in all this is that the people we trust to keep our secrets um, <laughs> probably are not doing a very good job at it. And uh -huh. we need to kind of review this whole system to make sure that when people are leaving office or so on, and they're yeah. packing up their stuff, that there's a thorough search that is done to make sure that they're not holding on to any documents or anything that yeah. they should have. And that's how it should be treated. But I think the fact that um the fact that now you have three, you know, two vice, you know, former vice presidents and, and one former president implicated yeah. in this, it becomes less likely that any one of them would be charged. Yeah. This I think it would um it would be very difficult for the DOJ to kind of carve out Trump mm -hmm. as a completely different thing and try to charge him and, mm -hmm. and and basically make a case that the others did nothing wrong. So yeah. I think it would be very difficult to do that. And I'm, I think that is the best outcome because at the end of the day, um, outside of mitigating whatever information may have leaked out, I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, this is something that we should use as an opportunity to shore up our documents mm -hmm. in this country and to make sure, you know, classified things are classified or maybe they need to review, yeah. you know, the classification system to make sure we're not classifying everything under the sun. And, yeah. and maybe that has to be reviewed. But mm -hmm. I hope that in the end, it is just a lesson to everybody that we can yeah. do better in the future. And we mm -hmm. shouldn't use this to kind of tear the country apart even yeah. further. Well, and I, I, when I was listening to all of the examples given, or even the White House briefings, like the the excuse at the time, or still is, in some cases, that like he didn't know that they were there. And in my mind, I'm like, that doesn't make That's me feel worse. better. <laughs> I know, yeah. I was just like, that just makes him look worse. Like he's already elderly. Like he already gets, you know, he already like makes gaffes in his speech. And just to tell me that like he didn't realize he had them in there, like that doesn't necessarily make that him look better. That means then that you're not protecting them. You're not keeping them <laughs> yeah. under lock. It's just strewn around your house. And then he doesn't know if he has it or if he like does anything. I, I was like, that, that's not good. I mean, I mean, I have to get at least on Trump's side, like at least he had them locked up. But I mean, I don't think it's right for any of them to have or in possession of classified. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you went back through other presidents and you managed to find some 
some documents, whether that they forgot that they had or held on to that aren't really secure. Like maybe there needs to be a better method of security. <laughs> like there maybe there needs to be a better protocol for that. But like it didn't make anything look better. Like I know I knew that they probably went out and they were trying to make excuses for, well, it wasn't as many as Trump and <laughs> Trump's fighting it. And it's like, well, because you know, you're accusing him of of possibly manipulating something or using something. Like it's the same argument as before with um you know, and they were trying to impeach him. Like it's, it's, you're looking for ways to target him, but then when it's in your own camp, you're like, oh, well, it's not as bad because of this. And it's like, well, no, it's, it's still the same crime. <laughs> I know, like, basically, it, it be... <laughs> basically they're saying, that they're saying, well, Trump is evil incarnate. And so know, yeah. <laughs> even if Trump grabs a glass of water to drink, there's know, probably yeah. something nefarious we can find about the I way mean... he drank the water, right? Yeah. And, and these other people are saints, they're good people. Uh-huh. And so even if you see them bashing somebody in the head, maybe there's a good reason they're bashing somebody in the head, right? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the way they've made it <laughs> so that everything Trump oh, does yeah. before they can even understand or hear what uh-huh. it is, is, they've already made a decision as to the fact that it is bad, it's nefarious, it's it's dangerous. Yeah. And, and, and then anything anybody else does, they assume that person is completely uh-huh. pure as, a, as the driven snow. And yeah. Then, and so even if you catch them doing something bad, it's because they may have a reason that yeah. we don't yet understand for why they had to do that thing. Exactly. And there's a lot of hypocrisy all around, it, but I hope like that- trying to weigh, It's like trying to weigh the evils. It's like exactly. making a greater evil, but it's still an evil. So it's still evil. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. Just because it's so lesser of an evil. We, we, have, um, we have politicians that actually care about yeah. these things. And the last thing I'm going to say also is the the Republicans, um, the House Speaker, the new House Speaker um, this week mm. um, removed two Democrats from the Intelligence Committee in yeah. Congress, um, Adam Schiff and mm-hmm. Eric Falwell, and he provided his reasoning for that. Um, of course, Adam Schiff was the former chairman of yes. the um, Intelligence Committee, and we know exactly what happened. I remember... Um, for me, the one thing that I remember that Adam Schiff did that was completely egregious was the mm-hmm. fact that he came um, at the beginning of this whole hearing about Trump collusion and so on. He, yeah. he read the what he kind of purported to be the call that Trump had with Zelensky, and it yeah. was completely made up fantasy of what. And and I I was just flabbergasted. Mm-hmm that he did that. He did yeah. not read the call. He did not read the transcript. He literally read an editorial that he had made on the transcript, yes. which was just completely shameful. And then he went around and claimed that he had access to evidence that proved mm-hmm. the whole case. And that mm-hmm. evidence was never brought forth. And we all know that it was basically made up. And then when the um, ranking member on that committee, who at the time was Devin Nunes, came out and said, I have gone, I have seen the intelligence, and here's my summary. Adam Schiff told us it was completely false. And then yeah. come to find out later on when it was all released, the memo that Devin Nunes wrote was actually the truth. And, <laughs> and so when you are in that kind of power position mm-hmm. and we're trusting you because you get to see things that we don't see, mm-hmm. it's really important to have integrity. And I know that you know you can find people on both sides of the aisle, think you know, mm-hmm. Santos, which I, I spoke about a couple of episodes ago, people yeah. who are willing to lie, steal, cheat in order to have power. And they, mm-hmm. they happen to be on both sides of the aisle. And we need yeah. to, be able to find those people and take the power that they seek from them. And and the same thing with Eric Swalwell. He was compromised because he was having an affair with someone who was purported to be a Chinese spy. And so yeah. sitting on the intelligence committee is not a right of any particular citizen. Yeah. And so if there is a, a, a sense of um, this kind of compromise, I think mm-hmm. it's it's a it makes sense to reevaluate yeah. whether a person can sit on that kind of a committee. But once yeah. again, people are going to look at it as a tit for tat for what Nancy Pelosi did to Republicans. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think you know this is the a little bit of politicking. But um, I don't know where I lie specifically except to say that if Kevin McCarthy believes that 
you know, the, the, those people cannot be trusted. And I have mm -hmm. seen evidence, basically public evidence, that these people are willing to lie to the American people um, mm -hmm. and hide behind the fact that they have access to things that we can't see ourselves yeah. and use that as a leverage to, yeah. to bolster the false arguments that they're making to yeah. the country. I think they did a lot more harm to the country than good. And um, and sometimes the, doing making that kind of a decision comes mm -hmm. with consequences. And so I'm okay with that. All right. So well, I think I think going back to like what you said about perception before too is I think a, a quality of, of people who are not trusting of the American people or trusting of people in general are ones that will shape and distribute their perception, right? Instead of just allowing the evidence to unfold or allowing the truth to unfold and allow people to judge it for themselves. They, they that's what I like, and even it can happen on both sides. And I see this happen a lot. They, they build a perception of like how they want people to see it. And this is, this is what we know. And this is how, you know, this is how it takes place. And this is what I've seen from this person, but I, it's always frustrating because it almost makes me feel like, like they think the American people are dumb. <laughs> like they think that we can't look at a situation and know and have that intuition to know what right from wrong and just give us the truth. And that's what some of that felt like. I remember, cause I watched the hearings and I watched all the way through cause I wanted to be able to judge the situation for myself. And there was so much information that just felt like it was prepared perception, you know, where it was, it was, this is, this is what was, what was written instead of just giving us and laying out everything, just give I us think... what was actually said. And there, and there were some points that was done and then some points it wasn't. And I kept thinking in my head, I was like, they must think we're really stupid. Like they must think that they have to feed this, us, this information in order for us to make the right decision. Or even if the, the, no. the American public makes a judgment and it's not in their favor, they're like, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up, hold up. Like, this is, this is how like, no, no, we're, we're supposed to see it this way. And, and, and no, it's, it's actually this way. Like, this is what we're trying to feed you. And they don't understand why people aren't latching on to their perception. And it's because they know that they're being lied to. I think, I, I think a lot of people have just an instinct of, I don't think you're telling me everything. And I don't, I, know. I don't, I don't think you're, you're doing what's right. And I'd rather just see the whole situation and judge it for myself and know that you were being completely honest in your presence than to just give me your perception and then have that, you know, yeah. be, like feeding me a lie. Like be obviously more people honest can, people in politics. Being more <laughs> honest. Yeah. Being All right. more, yeah. Jenny, honest thank you so much <laughs> for joining me today on this episode. Yes. Um, we're still trying to figure things out and we're oh, yeah. trying a lot of different things, Jenny. And <laughs> hopefully uh, we figure out, you know, what format we're going to go with going mm. forward. But I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. And, and the goal here is to keep the conversation going. So mm -hmm. thank you for listening to this episode. In the next uh, couple of episodes, we are actually uh, going to be interviewing some people. And so I'm planning to bring on um, a lady um, that I will be discussing uh, in a future episode. We'll probably record it sometime next week and then bring that to you. So thank you for joining us on today's episode of Restitch America. And I hope you had a great uh, conversation today and I hope to see you all next week. Have a good day.